I might not be able to crank this one out in like two weeks like normal. I mean, Lord knows this video alone took me a lot longer to make than I thought it would, and I already know the sequel is significantly longer, but I am going to try not to make you guys wait for too long. Time is unkind. It's also undeniable, just like gravity. When an apple's stem breaks free from a branch, we know it will fall to the relentless grasp of the Earth's pole. In the same sense, we know that every moment we experience in our life is time spent we cannot regain. Gravity pulls, time calls, and the universe demands the price for its constants. This video should have come out years ago. I fall into this trap a lot where things just come up, time passes me by, and this project just kept slipping further and further away from me. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe everyone can, yeah, especially considering the way the world has been the past couple of years. But maybe now is the perfect time to finally pick this game back up and see what there is to say about it. After all, time is kind of what this game is about. When I reviewed the original Gravity Rush, I cited it as a game that I loved but had issues with. It felt like something that had its ambition tampered with, where certain parts of the story were forced to be written down, or mechanics were shoved in to meet the demands of the platform it would debut on, but I also said this was a world I really wanted to see more of. It's bursting with potential, and while the original game left a lot of questions open in its narrative, they were intriguing questions I sincerely wanted to pursue answers to, and there were ways the gameplay mechanics could still grow while holding onto the game's unique charm. Several years would pass before Cat and Dusty would start in another major release, but we would still get to see a bit of them in the years between. Cat was made available as a playable DLC character in PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. You know, Sony's big attempt to overthrow Digimon Rumble Arena as the king of mascot party brawlers. She's got her own little campaign, unique moveset, the stuff you'd expect. There was a costume of her in Little Big Planet 2, as well as the Vita and kart racing titles. I'm told she also appeared in Ragnarok Odyssey Ace and something called Destiny of Spirits, but there's only so many of these games I can justify tracking down, and she even appeared in the most obvious game you could think of, Everybody's Golf World Tour. Okay, to be honest, I had a better time with this than I was expecting to, and I might actually end up playing more of this. Most of these games were released around the same time as that initial release, but it doesn't really feel so much like Sony making big pushes to make Gravity Rush a big deal, and more like Japan Studios also had their hands in these other titles and decided to throw her in. I'm honestly not sure how much faith Sony ever really had in this franchise. They wanted it to be a launch title for the Vita, but the Vita didn't really do well. Neither did Gravity Rush, and while a new game was in the works, Sony seemed to put less and less effort into getting the word out about this series. Possibly as a tactic to raise more interest in the franchise before the sequel was released was the creation of Gravity Rush Remastered by Bluepoint Studios, which I obviously already talked about a bit in the first video. Just a year afterwards, though, the next and last adventure with the Gravity Queen released, and instead of leading this review with a question like I normally would, I'd rather make a statement instead. You should have played Gravity Rush 2. Now, for the same reason the first game was released on consoles people actually own before the sequel came out, I recommend that you check out my video on the first Gravity Rush before watching this, partially just so you have context for everything we're going to be talking about. And yeah, this game comes with homework. With all that out of the way, spoilers ahead. This is Gravity Rush 2. There's a couple of things I think are important to go over before we take on the main campaign of this game. Both of these take place before the main events of Gravity Rush 2, a two-part animation called Gravity Rush Overture, and a DLC campaign called Raven's Choice. We'll start with Raven's Choice here, even though this was actually the last bit of content to be released, but it also takes place between the first game and everything else. It was released for free a bit after Gravity Rush 2 was launched, and honestly isn't too terribly long. You could probably beat it in about two hours. But it does give players a chance to spend a bit more time with a fan favorite character and someone who would take a new level of importance in the main game as well as put a little work into sort of retcon her origin and alter how she fits into the story's larger narrative. It also helps tie up some loose ends that Gravity Rush 2 just didn't seem terribly concerned about, like the other children that were rescued from lower on the world pillar and have been asleep in the arc ever since. This doesn't really come up in the main game, so the whole plot thread is given a little closure here and kind of serves as an excuse as to why it's never brought up again.
Pat and Raven are working with a local scientist to use some kind of device that can absorb energy from Nevi and be used to awaken the children sleeping inside the Ark. We see the creators return, voicing concerns about this experiment and that tampering with the laws of time, which seems to be the foundation of this procedure, can only have catastrophic results. Can you tell we're going to be talking about the concept of time a lot in this video? We even see a third creator appear, a boy named Bit. He warns the scientist, Dr. Brahman, that this will not go well, but also takes a moment to make a passive threat to towards this man. This is one of many reasons I recommend playing this before the main campaign. Sure enough, as soon as the device is active, something begins to happen and the Ark is sucked into a wormhole, along with Raven as she tries to prevent it from being lost. When she awakens, we see our temporary protagonist not as her older self we're familiar with, but as a child. The young girl known as Satya before she would later gain her powers and change her name. Bit appears and attempts to guide her, and this is where we spend a little time playing as Satya. It's essentially a prolonged stealth section where Satya must be guided around her subconscious to reclaim her memories before they're devoured by these mysterious creatures. We were given a brief moment to mess with the standard Gravity Rush gameplay, but it didn't last very long before this shift, and it's a change in gameplay style that risks putting off players a bit early on in this DLC. Now, again, none of this takes terribly long, and you're not stuck in this format forever, but there isn't a ton of interesting stuff going on here gameplay-wise. It's very basic stealth. I'm not sure what it looks like when you get caught because, well, it's not hard to stay hidden, or at the very least, escape an alerted enemy. You've got some light jumping and waiting to do, but beyond that, this felt like a really basic way to just dish out some exposition about Satya's past to the player while still giving them a reason to press buttons on the controller. It's fine, but certainly a concession of narrative over experience. We see how her bond formed with her adoptive brother, Zaza, how the two grew up in Hexaville, how their school bus fell to the abandoned village below, and how she was whisked away back to her original home while trying to gather supplies, and how she began to understand how time moves differently depending on where on the world pillar you are. It's a lot of rules and world building players of the first game would already be familiar with, but the refresher helps, and understanding the struggles Sachia encounters also informs her motivations. Why she was so determined to rescue the kids, and why she's so much older than them now. Having spent so much time trying to survive on her own while time moves slower for those she was separated from. When she had grown older, she met She, this little space crow that lent her the abilities of a gravity shifter, much like Dusty does for Cat. With this, she was able to travel to the abandoned village and using a new name to hide her identity, possibly to avoid troubling Zaza with shock, began working with him on a way to get the children home and, well, the rest is as we know it in Gravity Rush. Let's get scratching. As Satya gathers her memories, she's returned to her raven persona, reunited with Ji, and is able to move around freely with her gravity-shifting powers again, and now needs to guide around a memory of Zaza and keep him from getting attacked by the monsters, and yeah, I think it was a choice to not only start this DLC off with a slow stealth segment, but immediately follow it up with an escort mission, and while neither of them are at all the worst I've seen from either of these formats, they do, once again, feel pretty forced and not particularly fun or interesting in their own right, simply standing in as ways to justify the establishment of story elements. Thankfully, at the end of the road, with a good amount of her memories restored and Raven returning to Hexaville, the events here are starting to get a lot more interesting. We see that the experiment seemed to freeze time altogether, with the laws of time and space breaking at the seams, and even Kat herself seems to be trapped in this anomaly. After tracking down Gade and Sienya, she's tasked with trying to bring balance back to the fabric of this dream's reality, and this is easily the most interesting part of the game for me, where you attempt to summon the manifestations of light and darkness, playing this little game of territory with light and dark Nevi to bring the masters of these forces out. These battles against Lumino, the spirit of light, and Tenebria, the spirit of darkness, are really, really cool. They are simple simplistic mechanically. I'll have to get further into some issues with the combat and the discussion of the main game, but even in this concept alone, these are some of the most inspired encounters you'll see in either of these games. I think their designs are amazing, I love the music, and even this area comes into play to add a bit of dynamic to the struggle, needing to maintain control over the battlefield to prevent the enemy from absorbing enough power to unleash a devastating attack. After defeating them and escaping back into the mortal realm, the two gods follow her, coming at her with everything they've got while she tries to to reclaim what few memories of hers are still left in Wander. Doing so grants her enough power to take the two of them down, but the Collectors, the monsters from the Time Distortion, have begun attacking the Ark and even start going after a frozen cat, trying to erase her from existence. But Raven manages to get help of not only she, but also Dusty to destroy this threat for good. She? Z? Is it C? 
I feel like she said Xi at one point. I, I don't know how this is pronounced. This is another encounter that I think seals why this DLC is still worth playing through despite its rough start. This game knows how to establish a sense of stakes when it wants to, and while the pace of an escort mission can be irritating as the player is often left to rely on a sluggish AI of an NPC to progress forward, events like this where they need to protect the Ark and capture the attention of the collectors to drag them closer to Cat and Dusty instead leaves the agency entirely in their own hands, leading to a much more engaging and kinetic encounter. Not to mention how much of an epic and exciting tone is lent from the setting and sheer size of the enemy in question. It's also not often in these games that you'll be forced to fight enemies of your size, a humanoid figure that can move around as nimbly and quickly as you, and I've already gone over why Lumino and Tenebria are memorable on their own. These encounters that make up the second half of Raven's Choice add a lot to the experience, and more than make up for the slow start that gets us here. Once these encounters are completed, the narrative wraps up with Bit explaining to Raven that there's only one way to restore time back to its natural flow. As something had always been wrong with the structure of events, and it all centers around her and how she plays into things. There was never supposed to be a bus accident, but Raven was supposed to be here in this time period, which means she was meant to enter this world at a later time in her life, as Satya was never meant to exist. We know this because they came up with a new origin for her in Gravity Rush 2, and needed to find a canon explanation to hammer some boards over the plot holes. Essentially, Raven travels through time to stop the bus from falling, saving the children from their fate, but also erasing Satya from the timeline. Even though Satya would have been born before this, so as exciting as this chase after the bus wants to be, it doesn't really actually account for the character's origins, but it's fine. History moved forward with the children growing up in Hexville, and we see Raven in the modern day with Cat running into two familiar children. They're both descendants of the original Zaza, who the boy was named after. The girl says her name is Satya, named after the imaginary friend her grandfather used to have. As the kids run off, Raven is moved by this connection to her past that she elected to lose all memories of, and yeah, did Satya exist or not? Like, if she was Zaza's imaginary friend in this new chain of events, maybe the memories of her lingered in Zaza's memory, or maybe she did exist and Raven just doesn't have any memory of it now because Pitt tampered with her memory? I don't know. Time travel weirdness, it honestly doesn't make a lot of sense and it's kind of a mess to untangle, but you at least get the intent it's going for and can buy the emotional beat if you just decide to roll with it like I did. Raven's choice is still fun, at least in the second hour of playtime, and while the first half is not mechanically deep or really overly engaging, the context it lays down for the player is worth experiencing, and it does help explain how certain plot elements come into play in the main game, at least to some degree. It's a little sloppy in its execution, and I'm gonna be honest, trying to tug on the heartstrings right at the end kind of feels like a simple way of the game trying to convince the player that the emotional implications outweigh the missing logic, but I enjoyed it, and I think you will too, but it's best served after playing game one, as it ties more closely to the events and established characters of that game than anything with the second. Say for maybe Bit, who I think works just fine in a mysterious context, as is here. And hey, even if you're just in it to fight two of the most interesting Gravity Rush antagonists, it's not like there's a whole lot of time spent to get there. However, you might remember that Raven's Choice was not the only extra material connected to this title. Like I mentioned before, Cat got a few cameos and material from other games, largely projects that were also under the Japan Studios umbrella. There are a couple of Figmas that you are not going to be spending that much money on, put your wallet away. We really didn't see much outside of that though, which is kind of a shame. There was always something kind of fun about the merchandising crossovers, like Uncharted with Subway or Halo with Slurpees, I guess. And I mean, we know Cat and Raven love to eat. You'd think we'd see more stuff with the characters being put on like chips, candy bars, energy drinks, like G Fuel? I'd like to take a minute to thank our partners over at G Fuel. Whether you're out saving the world, making hour plus long YouTube videos about video games, or just going about your daily life, it's important to stay energized and hydrated, and that's where G Fuel comes in. They specialize in crafting energy drink formulas that not only taste great, will give you that extra boost you need without giving you the crashes or jitters by leaving out all that sugar you see in other energy drinks. You'll also see some creative flavors here that are inspired by some of your favorite franchises like Pac-Man, Sonic, Resident Evil, or Dragon Ball Z. A uh, Gravity Rush flavor would be great too, just saying. Make it an orange citrusy thing, call it Gravity Crush. It's a free idea. 
please use it. My personal favorite flavors right now are the Pina Colada Taste of Miami Nights or the Cadenza flavor inspired by Persona 3 Reload. Just take your powder, dunk it into your shaker full of water, give it a good mixing, and you're good to go. If you'd like to try out any of their great flavors, you can use my link in this video's description and my code WayneIsBoss at checkout to get 20% off your online order. You get great energy drinks and you help out the channel, which, if you ask me, that sounds pretty wizard as the kids would say. Huge thanks to G Fuel, huge thanks to you, and now, back to the video. While we didn't see a lot from this series between the release of the games, I do know that at some point there was a two volume manga based on the main narrative, but we also got a pretty direct tie-in just before the release of the sequel. A few days after a demo for the game was launched, we saw the two part release of Gravity Rush the Animation Overture. Part one takes place during the events of Gravity Rush 2 and is mostly just a fun look at an average battle against a horde of Nevi attacking the new hub area of the game and lending a little foreshadowing to the larger threat the game will encounter. It also showcases the new designs the characters have in the game, but I'm gonna be honest, outside of Sid, I didn't really notice the designs change at all, but I guess I see a couple of differences. It's upbeat, it's energetic, it makes a good use of the game's great sense of humor, and shows off a bit of the new score. Part 2, however, is where stuff starts to become a bit more crucial. This part rewinds a bit to show what happens between Raven's Choice and the second game, and this context is constantly referred to in the story and is incredibly important to understand how our characters got separated from Hexaville. Building the foundation for one of the central antagonists and this is the only place you'll see any of this, even down to certain characters that show up in the animation and nowhere else. We see Cat and Raven relaxing at home, eating junk food, and catching us up to speed with what life is like now that the main threats of the city have been dealt with. This interaction is adorable too, you can really see how much spending time with Cat has really brought out the best in Raven. They seem to be very good friends. It doesn't seem like all has been well though, as a new menace has been causing problems in the city, kidnapping orphan children one after the other. A case that's honestly more disturbing than other world creatures that occasionally need to be beaten up. This is more down to earth, a threat that's more human. As the two are talking, an announcement goes out that a problem is occurring with the gravity engine of New Herillion. A large government facility centralized to its own floating island and a fierce gravity storm is brewing. Our heroes arrive to find that the facility has been overtaken by some unknown force. Clearly, the kidnapper of the orphans as he's taken over the lab and trapped the bodies of the children inside several pods there for some unknown reason. Cat and Raven arrive on the scene and try to apprehend him, but they're quickly attacked by these two figures who put up an alarmingly good fight. Even Sid has to get involved at one point, and we get to see our characters moving around with flair and style and really showing off the impressive animation on display here. I'm pretty sure this is done with 3D models, but it's some of the best 3D anime that I've looked at, with enough restraint to keep anything from looking distracting, but using enough expression and movement where necessary to keep things feeling alive. I really do love the way these animations look, and they're a feast for the eyes, and a good case as to why a movie based on this universe should be animated and not live action. Regardless of the efforts of our heroes, the attackers are pretty sore losers and self destructive leading to the island getting sucked into the growing gravity storm as the children and our protagonists are whisked away into the void, floating away to parts unknown. Where and when will they end up? The only way to find out is by playing Gravity Rush 2. Or by watching this video, I guess. This animation is not included in the game itself. The context it provides and the elements laid within it are only portrayed in the animations uploaded to YouTube, which is kind of nuts because Gravity Rush 2 does not spend any time getting you acquainted with what happened here and simply expects you to know what's already going on. Now, if you got the limited edition sold exclusively in Japan, you would get a Blu-ray of both parts of Overture, so there is a version of this game that was released with the setup to the main plot. This is also where I was reminded that not only does this series itself go by a different name overseas, originally referred to as Gravity Days, but Raven and Cat also have different names in the original Japanese versions, as Crow and... Kitten. Makes it feel like the characters are gonna tell me I'm posting memes in the wrong chat, not gonna lie. What a weird way to go about handling this. It's just under 20 minutes of animation and maybe it wouldn't fit on the game's Blu-ray? I really don't know. There's been talks and supposed confirmations that this game will receive a new port to the PS5 and PC later this year, and if that's true, well, that's gonna make certain parts of this video sort of outdated, but it would be a great opportunity to fix that issue and at least make part two of Overture viewable before the events of the game. And then there's that. When I heard that a remaster of this game might be coming, I wondered if it would be a good idea to hold off on this video until it was released, but I decided against it for a couple of reasons. One, it's been too damn long since my last video, and for that, I am sorry, and I wasn't about to make you wait for more content based on a rumor that might not even be true. And second, if it is going to happen, this is the perfect time to tell you why you should care about this game getting a second shot. 
I want to emphasize this again. This video going forward is going to be filled to the brim with spoilers, and I'm going to be putting a lot of emphasis on the title's story, how its plot is delivered, and discussing how I interpret the themes put forward. I've walked you through the main foundation, but if you want to experience any of the main meat of Gravity Rush 2 firsthand, I recommend either playing the game for yourself now, or be prepared to support the re-release if and when it's available. Don't get me wrong, I want you to hear what I have to say, but I wanted to at least give a fair warning. Alright, now I think we're far enough into the video to start talking about the game it's actually named after. Somewhere off in the sea of clouds, an explorer donned in mining gear descends into a thick ocean of strange particles and unsettling sounds. Their surrounding warps, matter shifts and flows upward like a lava lamp. Nothing here feels natural. Everything is strange, but while they don't seem to like it, to them, this is routine. As they reach the surface of a ruined city below, they search for deposits of some kind of ore among the silent rubble resting within raging perpetual storms. What civilization lived here? What was the purpose behind these buildings and structures? It doesn't really matter. All that's left here now are pockets of resources that can be useful later. As they walk through the site with their comrade, reports start flying in about an oncoming storm and many of the workers start to evacuate, but not our two main leads. They've gone days without a proper meal and only just arrived and if they don't have something to bring back, they'd be going to bed with empty stomachs once again. But the growing gravity storm wasn't going to make things easy for them, tossing the two workers back and causing their suits to malfunction. As our main hungry employee removes the helmet, we see... Cat and Sid. The two have to discard their clunky suits quickly and make a run for it to escape back to the surface before the gravity storm tears the landscape apart around them. Dodging debris, jumping to intact ledges, and you'll notice quickly that Dusty is nowhere to be seen, same as Cat's ability to shift gravity. The two are rescued, but their current boss is not happy with them, not only bringing back no ore at all, but also costing the crew two diving suits. Cat brings us up to speed, briefly citing the storm from the overture animation that flung her and Sid into an unfamiliar place where the woman, now known as Lisa, picked them up. Up and in exchange for a place to sleep and any kind of food, are put to work mining gravity ore in pockets beneath the clouds. They have no idea what happened to Dusty or Raven, and they have nowhere to go. Essentially stranded on this floating, mobile mining town, the Banga Settlement. <laughs> Control is given back to the player. In the brief time we've played, we've run through a first-person perspective, raced through a crumbling environment, and are now faced with a landscape of floating homes and structures connected by various bridges, and we're sort of brought down to earth in a sense. We have to be mindful of the landscape here, unless we want to go falling off into the void of clouds beneath us. As Lisa starts to send us on errands around the settlement, we need to contend with the fact that we are mortal, and we can't rely on the ability to change the outcome gravity will have on us. I honestly like this mechanically, but both for new and old players. For those who never got a chance to play Gravity Rush, the environment they are now tasked with exploring is not just new to them, but also still fairly new to Cat and the people she interacts with know of her, but don't really know her yet. All they know is this girl and her friend showed up out of nowhere and she keeps going on about these gravity powers that they and a new player have heard of, but haven't seen. Old players, however, are being humbled, given a moment where they need to look at the layout of the location in a way they haven't had to worry about before, feeling just as stripped of power as Cat herself is. I think it was a good idea to scatter several side quests in this opening area as well, as it gives the player a chance to get a sense of place and community for Banga, and presenting them in a time when the player is forced down to their level will communicate to the players that these quests are something they'll be seeing a lot of in the game, and might help them stick as something that they'll want to keep checking in on. There's a lot of moving parts here. We see how tightly knit the people here are. As we go about completing tasks, others will have new ones for us, and the sense of community we see on display is built by people that live with and rely on each other to keep their daily tasks in line. Checking on fuel supplies, keeping track of livestock, maintaining a constant flow of communication. This is how we're shown that one quest can easily lead to another, branching into new tasks to accomplish, and how Kat's relationship with the cast of the game is often built by how she interacts with them and helps them out with their daily lives. It also showcases a major roadblock I kept running into when trying to plan this review in that there's 
a lot of character interaction. At times, this game feels like 30% visual novel with the amount of characters there are to help and talk to and the amount of world building they have to offer. There is a surprising amount of dialogue on display here, and I want to stress, I don't think that's a problem. I think it's one of the game's core qualities, especially with the writing being as good as it is, but it did feel like it was teaching me a lesson about how to try to break down information. I can't possibly go over every bit of interaction here, partially because this video would be so much more of a citation of the game's plot and not so much of a discussion of its design and interactive experience, but also because it would take way too much away from what I've come to appreciate about the details between the lines. The major plot beats are one thing, but those small one-on-one -on -one interactions are best experienced by the player. There are some essential relationships and events we do have to cover, of course, as Kat is set off to find a girl named Cece. She's a bit younger than Kat, but it's established she was also found adrift with unknown origins and seemingly no memory of where she came from. While she's expected to work and contribute to the settlement, Lisa does seem to have a bit of a soft spot for her, treating her in at least some way as an adoptive daughter. Not long into her search, though, it seems like another storm is brewing near the settlement, this time bringing Nevi with it. It seemed like even separated from Hexaville, this world faced faces similar threats, even if different regions have different names for them. I think it's a nice touch that the people in this area refer to the Nevi as Scarabs. Whatever you prefer to call them though, they start closing in on CC, but thankfully, a familiar face comes in to offer a bit of help, as Dusty just sort of appears here, possibly brought here by the same storm, and at this point these things are basically just acting like dangerous portals across this world. With Dusty and Cat reunited, our hero is able to call on her gravity shifting abilities once again, defeating the Nevi and rescuing the girl. From here, Cat is able to establish her own positive place in the settlement, now able to carry out tasks for others with incredible speed and efficiency, and even takes the time to go mining beneath the clouds again, this time gathering plenty of ore and improving her relationships with the other workers of the colony. The colony is ready to return to the larger city of Jirgaparalau, but have to first have their ore haul investigated by Vogo's son, a less than honest merchant who tries on several occasions to cheat the Bonga settlement, even leading to Cat exploring a forbidden mining site to retrieve the highest quality ore possible. This is one of the few areas of the game that act a lot like like the Enchanted Zones from the first title, more like a traditional level than the more open-ended areas with scattered objectives in the overworld. You're mining ore along the way, yes, but you're also tasked with several challenges that in time will get you more familiar with your abilities beyond just falling with style. You've got other maneuvers here from the first game like the Gravity Slide that will let you move along the ground and sort of manipulate gravity around whatever surface your feet are currently on, negating the need to constantly shift, and of course the ability to hold down the square button while falling to go into a dive and increase your speed. You're also given more of a chance to play around with combat here, showcasing the same kicks and basic combos we're familiar with, as well as the SP meter which, when full, grants you the ability to unleash a devastating attack like a drill kick that automatically targets nearby enemies or weak points, which can be handy for bigger opponents with more spots to hit, but is too uncontrollable to use on groups of smaller enemies. Like, using this is the only time I felt disoriented from the constantly changing gravitational orientation. This is where the game also familiarizes the player with one of the most useful abilities a gravity shifter has at their disposal, and something I wound up doing so much more in this game than I did in the first. Throwing crap. If there's stuff around you that you can toss, this should be your go-to. It's so effective, almost too effective, if it weren't for the fact that this ability can be limited by the amount of junk you do or don't have in your general presence. In most fights with tossable objects, fights can be over incredibly quickly if you just pick stuff up and hurl it at anything with a pulse. We uh, might be coming back to this later. Even with these challenges complete and the finest ore imaginable in tow, Vogo takes some work to get past, trying to nickel and dime the settlement before even his own right-hand man and brother has to turn against him due to his own lack of honor, and the Bonga settlement is finally able to wear down the old cheapskate and return home. Jirga Paralau seems like it was likely the first idea the team came up with for this game, the logical conclusion to expanding on the game's core premise to more powerful hardware. In an interview with Gravity Rush Central, Toyama stated that this sequel was actually originally being developed for the PS Vita, but the tough decision was later made to lengthen the time for development by switching to the PS4 hardware. But with the added benefit of achieving the more ambitious goals they had that maybe wouldn't have been possible on the handheld. And if this city landscape is any indication, yeah, I'm not sure how well the Vita would have handled 
all this. Jirga Paralau is absolutely massive, a sprawling airborne landscape full of multiple islands between the huge bustling marketplace, the soaring skyscrapers of the more residential areas, all overflowing with NPCs walking around, going about their daily lives, chatting, shouting, filling the location with a sense of life. You do see more than a few duplicate models for these citizens, but the way it's all packed in here still evokes the feeling of a location bursting at the seams with life and activity. It's really something else. The player has so much more freedom here to explore and soar through the skies, often relying on these mid-air pickups that will refill their gravity gauge so they can still sail through these wide open areas to reach far off locations. I immediately started to explore, searching the underbelly of buildings for precious gems I could use to fill this game's skill tree, letting me expand things like the complexity of my attack combos or how many objects I could pick up and throw at once. Being able to chain my slide into a powerful attack if I connected it with an enemy, the upgrades are not something I felt compelled to fully fill out, but there were definitely some helpful perks here and made exploring around the city and completing trials feel rewarding. Let's get scratching. There's not just your typical side quests out here, but also challenge missions to complete, which will give you tasks like racing through an area for a good completion time, defeating enemies under a specific time limit to gain certain levels of points, and depending on how well you do within set ranks, you'll be rewarded with lots of precious gems that you can use on upgrades. You can also return to old mining sites and collect gems that way, and I believe fight off some strong enemies for bonuses, that sort of thing, but I didn't really bother doing this much. Because as neat as some of those mining sites can be, I simply didn't think they were as compelling as the overworld world, and I got plenty of gems just fine by helping out characters in the world and feeling a deeper connection to the city. Those main side quests took up more of my time, especially when they led to really funny character interactions or just wild or unexpected tasks, like protecting someone's shop from getting messed up by mobsters, or more touching missions like trying to reunite a lonely mother with her son who left home to start his own business. But even in these more heartfelt setups, the writers found ways to pepper in their sense of humor to keep a nice, upbeat attitude to everything. There was one mission that got some direct use out of the new camera mechanic that's interesting. Okay, so Sid gives you a camera when you first arrive on Jerka Paralau, which is nice considering his little tumble from the beginning of the game gave him a minor injury he's been using to get out of work while we run around doing errands for him. So at least he contributed something to us beyond just having every straight young lady within a 20 mile radius fawning over him. We can use this to take pictures of cats since it has a tripod function, but there will be some missions that call on us to take pictures of various pieces of evidence, references, events, or locations. Like capturing pictures of underhand deal with the local government for a determined, if sort of cowardly, news reporter, or helping this old guy relive his youth by taking pictures of women around the city. Oh boy, I don't like that. Poor Cat seems innocent enough about whatever his intentions might be with those photos, which my lawyer has told me to not make any hard claims about, because she even offers a cute picture of herself, which the guy ends up seeming disappointed by. Which, you know what, all right, yeah, I don't think we owe this guy any gratification, so let's just move right along now. This is also a great time to take in the game's wonderful presentation and fully appreciate it too. The visuals are wonderful, and I I love this game's art direction, and you'll see so many instances where they really went to great lengths to use color and shadows to great effect, lending to a gorgeous and vibrant world. Once again, that fading comic effect is used as we're dealing with more powerful hardware, and the draw distance limitations aren't as present as they were before, but I couldn't help but feel in some places the effect wasn't quite as pronounced. It's there, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't feel prominent. Like, the more gradual lighting kind of takes away from the effect where the distant objects would have been depicted more with the outlines of foreground elements set over a gradient color. Now stuff does look a bit more natural, but I did kind of miss the strength of a unique visual element from the first title. Thankfully, the music is back in full swing. The first game has an incredible score, and the sequel follows suit, full of sweeping melodies and beautifully orchestrated pieces that sell the tone of each area and situation incredibly well. Some are intense and exciting, where others are more peaceful and soft. It's a brilliant collection of sounds and tones that help immerse you in the locations you venture into. There's there's still a few tracks on the first title, like the original battle theme or Ruined Paths that are exclusive to the first game and remain my favorite songs across both titles, but that's definitely not to call the OST of this game lacking, as it especially lends itself well to exploring the vast new city environment. There's more to this city than we see at first glance, though, as there is a pretty stark separation of the classes here, where the rich and powerful live high above the city in this gaudy, mansion-riddled set of islands. You know, because it's the upper class. 
These people are so cartoonishly and unapologetically evil too. It's honestly hilarious. This one line got a huge laugh out of me. There is no subtlety here at all. We even see this one woman who's been collecting fuel that she knows people need just to burn it. No logical reason, she just likes the bonfires for parties, I guess. The hell is the matter with these people? We reconvene with Vogo, who tells us some of the shipment we gave him that he owes to the city's council has gone missing, presumably stolen by a local group of crooks called the Angry Centipede. And after a bit of asking around, Around, we try to follow them down into the slums of the city, hiding under the rest of the civilization in a very dark and very depressing set of rundown homes called Le Algona. This is the home of the lower class, the victims of a society that is constantly feeding into the pockets of those with plenty, while people either work themselves to the bones just to get by, all in the service of keeping the cycle going, or those who have lost everything and have to fight for scraps just to see tomorrow. This isn't commentary on anything, I don't know what you're talking about. Kat is devastated by this sight, her pure sense of justice immediately telling her, hey, this system is broken and needs to go. She tries to recruit help, but for a lot of people, it's not that easy. Trying to fight this system would mean sacrificing what little they already have, forced to focus on making sure that they have food and shelter tomorrow so they have to play ignorant to the injustices occurring today. They've been so thoroughly convinced that their future can only entail one thing that their present doesn't even matter. It's just something they need to survive through. It's like using societal security as a carrot on a stick to keep the machine churning. But where Kat's concerned, I mean, she used to live in a sewer drain. She's already in touch with one of these social classes more than the other and starts revolting against the council and their forces who keep this city under its iron grip. They even bring out their secret weapon to fight her at one point, and you'll never believe who this mysterious character is. It's Raven. She's been brainwashed. Cat kicks her around a bit, brings her back to her senses, and among their happy little reunion, decide to join forces to bring down the council and forcing this choking way of life. This leads to battles with local law enforcement, appealing to the other people in their growing friend group, and an attempt to gather intelligence on the enemy that leads to Cat being sent on a recon mission where she gets confused for someone else and is forced to perform at a party to stay undercover. Is this scene a little forced and the logic leading to it a little cliche? Yes, but it's also cute. Cat gets a pretty dress and the jazzy version of this song is great, so I think it was worth it. But maybe working with Vogo to get some of this done was a bad idea as he betrays the group for his own self-interest. And Cat and Raven's allies are arrested and imprisoned by the rulers of this oppressive society. The council makes a power play, using this control to force Cat and Raven to delve into a gravity storm to retrieve research that was lost in there as the council was investigating these anomalies that have been increasing in size and number. This is another trial area, this time introducing us to a new mechanic the game has up its sleeve called a shifting style, this one in particular being the lunar style. This makes Cat much lighter, allowing her to descend slower but also jump much higher and even send herself soaring off from a ledge through the air without actually needing to shift gravity. This ability is something that I came to appreciate more over time, and I think it's especially handy in the big city. You really do save time moving through this land landscape by being able to jump higher without having to worry about stopping to shift gravity all the time. It's a little snappier than what came before, and it gives you a new way to adapt to different platforming scenarios, but also comes with a couple of unique abilities. When using the Lunar Style in combat, using basic kicks becomes the Wormhole Kick, letting Cat warp to the nearest enemy to attack them directly instead of needing to dive at them. Addressing the issue of tackling larger groups and making it feel much more manageable to take on bigger pockets of smaller enemies. It also changes how using the Stasis Flow to pick up and throw objects works, though I find it to be not super helpful, or at least too slow to really serve a clear benefit over the simple act of throwing. When throwing an object at an enemy in Lunar Style, it'll do bits of damage in rapid succession, but I think it works best if you hold down the throw button so it actually activates and immobilizes the enemy while they're getting hit? I don't know man, I didn't use this much, it felt slower and more cumbersome. Now the third ability Lunar Style adds is much more helpful. The Gravity Typhoon, replacing your SP attack and hurling objects at enemies, absolutely 
absolutely overwhelming them in an onslaught of debris. It's beautiful. You know what's not beautiful? The state of the island New Heraleon. Yeah, that place where they fought the orphan kidnappers henchmen in the Overture anime? That entire place got sucked into this rift plane and has become a breeding ground for Nevi, and it's becoming clear that as more of these storms are developing, the ability for the Nevi forces to grow and take stronger forms is only increasing. Even as Cat and Raven barely make it back to Jerkaparalau, the storms are still getting worse and Nevi start appearing there as well, terrorizing citizens, all while the council starts putting together plants to start sending civilians down to work in the mines where they'll be lucky to even last a minute, all for the sake of gathering more ore. Increasing profits, tearing down the homes of the lower class to build amusement parks, crap like that, and Lisa has had enough. Recalling the pride of her tribe that were once destroyed and colonized to bring out her fighting spirit and finally aiding Cat in revolting against this council, helping in a rescue mission to get their people back and overthrow the corrupt government, ensuring that under new leadership, this pursuit of progress and obsession with the ideal future does not come at the expense of people in the here and now so the future can be bright for all, not just for the fortunate few. What a wild adventure. Seems like a pretty substantial plot on its own, right? So it keeps going. New Heraleon itself has become possessed by the Nevi, and the entire island has turned into a giant monster erupting from the Rift Plane, killing the council and threatening to take down the rest of Jergaparalau with it. Sure! Saw that plot development coming from a mile away! Lisa is already struggling in her new role as the leader of the city, but now has this apocalyptic threat to deal with too. I do like that it's not just a clean transfer from bad leadership to a more well-intentioned leader, so now everything is hunky-dory. The old system left a lot in its wake that needed to be fixed, and that wasn't going to happen overnight. So I'm happy they showed that the activism and revolution were good, and the extreme measures taken to dismantle oppression and injustice were worthy goals, but if you're gonna carry all that out, you need to take responsibility for the work that will come after to build up something better. It's not as easy as just beating the bad guys. That said, the rest will have to wait because we do actually gotta go take on a really big bad guy. Cat and Raven work together to destroy the giant Nevi city. Somehow it even used smaller Nevi to kidnap Cece among all the confusion, and the girls venture into the possessed island itself to go save her. Though during this rescue attempt, Sid also gets attacked and his fate is left a little unclear. What's neat is this actually acts like another rift plane, also granting us access to the other shifting style, the Jupiter style. This makes Cat much heavier, and while she's very slow on her feet, even during combat, she falls much faster and has much more power behind her attacks. Now instead of throwing single objects with the stasis field, you can bundle a bunch of debris together and hurl it at the opponent in one big ball, and her SP move in this style is a black hole. Stunning. I really appreciate that the team used the new gravity shifting styles to play with new ways not only to enhance the traversal, but the combat as well, something that felt a little undercooked in the original. Now, don't get me wrong, the battles still aren't terribly complex, and a part of that is likely due to the very nature of this game. When you're constantly floating around enemies and your perspective is changing and they're all moving around, it's hard to feel a lot of control over the battlefield, so the enemies need to have these bigger, obvious weak spots or really simple gimmicks to overcome. Stuff like a hard shell that needs to be broken before their core is exposed, or really big windows of vulnerability to balance the challenge with the controls. But with these styles, you're given specific attacks that are especially effective against particular enemy types, so if you find yourself confronting a cluster, you can use the Lunar style to warp kick them one by one without having to readjust yourself too often, or when facing a big but slow enemy with a lot of weak points that all need to be destroyed, a diving kick with the Jupiter style can take some time to charge, but connecting the attack results in destroying it very, very quickly. My main complaint is with single agile enemies, because they seem like they should be more intense in evenly matched face-offs, but in reality, they sort of just become an excuse to use the stasis field and throw junk at them, which, even with everything else at your disposal, is usually just the most efficient and easiest way to kill these things, which makes a couple of these encounters feel more basic than I think they were supposed to. I think a lot was done to contend with how this game needs to be played, but there are certain challenges you can't just wave away, and the nature of moving around relying on a free camera means no reliable enemy lock-on during fast-paced fights, and a decent amount of flailing around just trying to get a good target on things. It is far from unplayable, and honestly, with the amount of usable moves at your disposal, I'd even call it good, but it does have its messy spots, and that much can't really be denied. That said, the larger boss encounters seem to have a good grasp on how to best take advantage of the combat style in all its simplicity, and at the very least, add a good sense of scale as we see the core of this giant nevy monster that seems to be holding CC captive, and even possibly using her as an energy source. I really love the look of this thing, and how well it handles giving 
giving you a reason to travel all over high and low in the arena to take it on, a great use of the mechanics. And of course, the finisher moves. They're not really complicated mechanically. You reach a boss's health down to zero, and then you press a button to watch this animation play out, but it is always satisfying to see. Even after rescuing CC and defeating this creature, the city is still going to have plenty of wounds to heal, and to make matters worse, Sid is still MIA, like I mentioned before, and the rift that the Nevi escaped from in the first place takes Raven and CC in with it as it closes. Cat gives chase, but even inside the void, she's separated from her friends, lost once more in an unfamiliar void. But she's soon approached by some familiar faces. Gade and Sianya actually show up here, and wow, I mispronounced a lot of names in the first video, didn't I? These guys might be classified as gods, or more specifically creators in this universe, but their powers are incredibly limited. It really feels like there's more that they can't do than what they actually can, so they're not exactly here to fix anything, but it's nice to see them again. Adding a bit of a tie-in to the first game, since everything else has been placed so far away from the first title setting, but after they disappear and Kat tries to follow them through the rift, she finds herself in another unexpected place. Home. We've seen a city obsessed with working towards some vague, uncertain future, failing to learn from the past, like the cruelty committed towards Lisa's tribe, but also neglecting the present and the people living within it. But is it enough to just shift all focus over towards the opposite? We should learn from the past, but we cannot become slaves to it. As Kat begins to explore her old home, bit by bit she's seeing that things are not the way she left them. Time has passed since she was sucked into that rift. The way time dilation operates in this world is strange, and the rift planes likely only tamper with it more, so the people that she knew are older and the city has moved on beyond its need for the Gravity Queen. In fact, a new hero has taken her place, Callie Angel, who might not be able to shift gravity, but she can hold her own in a fight and has been doing a pretty good job protecting the town from the Nevi that appear in gravity storms. What's more, Hexaville now has a security system made up of little robots called Grigos who patrol the streets and even some machines that seem to be able to absorb the gravitational disturbances that allow the creatures in. All created by some brilliant scientist known as Dr. Brahman, who started working for the city's betterment after our lead characters have disappeared. Even old friends seem to have moved on. Aki's store moved to the entertainment district. Yuji and his dad Aljan have aged but are at least just as bitter as ever so I guess some things haven't changed. But what little comfort Kat might take in returning to the place that she knew is dashed as her home has been turned into a dump. She's got bugs in her bed, and she's even thrown out of the old pipe, told that she needs to register as a citizen to even be assigned a home. This girl was living in a sewer drain and told she can't even have that. She searches for places to stay, but the old industrial island of the town has been turned into a haven for unlucky souls all trapped in a similar fate. Homeless, with no place to stay but the streets or in whatever abandoned homes aren't subject to Nevi attacks. This section has one of my favorite uses of a mechanic the game incorporates where you may be tasked with finding information about something by simply walking among the people and hitting a button to speak with them. A lot of the time, they'll have nothing to say, but every so often you do get some important information or at least a good interaction from people. Getting a sense of place not just through standard exposition, but through a direct interaction with the population that makes up the city. It may also help them connect with her frustration and her growing desire to go back, a longing for the past. Beyond manipulating the flow of gravity to go falling off in any direction of your choosing or battling nightmare creatures from across the void, I think one of this game's remarkable strengths is the smaller, more subtle ways it uses player interaction to involve you with the story it wants to tell. It uses small tactics and sections of gameplay that can be as simple as moving from a few waypoints scattered across the map just to be repeatedly told, no, you can't sleep here, this is my place, to a surprising effect as you're not just seeing Cat's plight or being told about it, you're experiencing it yourself in real time, sharing in that disorientation as a town that you should feel welcomed and appreciated in feels cold, distant, and alien. In my review of the first game, I remarked that I preferred the title Gravity Rush given to the series in the West as I thought that it held more significance to the gameplay, but now I don't know if I stick by that. Kat is constantly getting hit with revelations, consistently pulled from her perceived understanding of the world around her, perpetually in a daze as she sends spinning in a universe that has its own thing going on with no real interest to her confusion or lack of control. I'm at the point now where I think I kind of prefer the name Gravity Days as I think it fits with the narrative-centric aspects 
of the gameplay, and I think it helps elicit a different tone you would come to expect when picking up the controller. And it doesn't stop here. As she's trying her best to find a place to stay, a man accidentally crashes his airboat on the island while trying to travel to the entertainment district, and at this point, both Kat and likely the player are feeling desperate to be needed again, to serve a purpose of progression and agency. Even if it's just to carry this man over to the district and help him reminisce about the days he spent with his daughter here before he lost her. Answering his questions about how we perceive the flow of time and what aspects of our understanding of time is most important to us. Of course, it's a little strange that we're also helping him evade the law, but we later discover it's because this is Dr. Brahman, the very same scientist who's been helping keep this town safe in our absence and now is the new mayor of Hexaville since Danelica was brooded from the picture. He just wanted some peaceful time away from his bodyguards, that's all. As a show of gratitude, he has Kat's old home cleaned up with a new bed installed and she's officially registered as a citizen with this on the book as her new legal home. Now, maybe you're thinking he could have gotten her set up in a place a bit nicer, but I think this actually makes sense for him. After all, he understands the comfort and nostalgia, and the desire to just go back to the way things were. And maybe it's appropriate that this is a part of the game where we don't really learn any new gameplay techniques. There's no new mechanics, no new shifting styles, not really. But that isn't to say we don't find new ways to play with what we already know. This is where I spent a lot more time with side quests and challenge missions, and seriously, if you don't take the time here to experience these, you are missing out. Now, once again, I can't go into every detail, I cannot dissect every single mission here, but trust me, this is the meat on the bones of this game, and this is a huge part of the package. One great part is how it uses Cat's abilities in creative ways, like this guy is having trouble getting customers to his shop, right? You can run around and give out flyers, that's fine, but how about a more direct approach? Just go grab some people and bring them over to the stall, which is what I thought they wanted me to do here, but no. What they're actually looking for you to do is run and grab people and start chucking them at the stall at full force. And not just the men, but the women and the children too. Even the cops, no one cares. Whatever this guy's selling must be real good because they just start buying it once they readjust their broken bones. How about breaking Ajan's drinking habit so he'll spend more time with his son? It's a noble cause and it has a heartfelt conclusion, but somehow they even make this funny, where you need to run around to every bar in the area area before he gets there and pretend to be an employee telling him he can't come in and it gets more frantic and fast paced as he gets more desperate until it finally wears him out. Why don't you play the role of a movie star, or more accurately, the stunt woman for the upcoming hit film Battle Nurse. If they actually make that Gravity Rush movie, I better see this brought up somewhere, I swear. Why don't you dress up as Kelly Angel and try to convince people you really like this ice cream from a specific stall. One thing I find cute is that Kelly sees Kat doing this and just thinks it's funny. Kelly can be pompous and she and Kat absolutely have a bit of a rivalry going, but she's not like pure evil or anything. I kind of like that she's not so full of herself that she can't just let Kat get away with this blatant impersonation. It's revealed she's Dr. Brahman's adoptive daughter, so it makes sense that his good word would have softened Kat and Kelly's view at least somewhat. You can uncover a cult of students worshipping what they think is a demon, but it turns out it was really just a rumor based on that girl that was morphed with a Nevi in the first game. Throughout all of these scenarios, all of these missions, you see so much of this world and it makes it all feels so much bigger and like a place I can call home. Helping a man and his son mend their relationship, trying to help a young boy move on after the death of his grandfather, helping Aki with her customers to ensure the best fortune, all the while filled with moments of genuine humanity or even a few laughs. This is where the game shines and I love it so much for that. The sad thing is, because the gameplay itself often relies on such simple mechanics as moving from place to place and sometimes throwing a few things, or people. There's only so much I can say before all I'm accomplishing is taking away from the fun of just seeing where the writing goes. There are actually some permanent benefits from completing certain side missions as well, as you can unlock a bunch of fun outfits that Kat can wear, even if I do tend to default back to her standard outfit. Still, they're great for using with the photo mode, and there was even a DLC for this costume inspired by 2B from Nier Automata. I'm assuming these were released in similar windows. The downside? There are some costumes that you just can't get anymore. There was this system where you could share photos that you shot with the camera with other players online. They could rate your pictures and you would be awarded with dusty tokens and by getting a bunch of them you could unlock several different costumes. The thing is, I can't actually show you any of this because the servers that kept this service going shut down six years ago along with all the leaderboards for the challenge missions that the game will still try to access after attempting a run. Appropriate, I guess, that even this game would have elements that have succumbed to the tides of time. You know, among some of these more combat-centric missions, 
missions, it kind of got me thinking, too. I like the battle theme in Gravity Rush 2, but it doesn't hit the same way the fight music from the first game did, and I was kind of hoping that encountering Nevi back in the world from the first title would bring that track back, but no such luck. Ah, uh, see? This game has me pining for something in the past. It's, uh, thematic. Or something. Now, some side missions I do find almost essential are the ones where Cat is trying to help tie up loose ends with the old abandoned case of the missing orphans. While a clear answer to what really happened is not achieved here, I think it's worth noting the wounds that these events left on the town. Their now seeming permanent disappearance left a scar that was never forgotten, and the lack of answers only makes that more tragic. Answers do exist, though, as Dr. Brahman attempts to host a speech but is attacked by a group of rebels, and after confronting them, Cat discovers Unica and uh, this other girl, Permit, who I do not remember. I don't even actually know if she was in the first game, is among these rebels and describes Brahman as a madman and a monster, a revelation that Kat discovers is true as the doctor tries to recruit our hero, explaining that he once had three daughters, so to speak. One, Callie's direct sister, has long since gone missing. We know about the town's current angel, of course, and then there was the first who had been struck with a deadly illness. In an attempt to cure her disease, he accidentally slowed down the effect time had on her, down to the point where it was like she was frozen completely. His daughter isn't dead, she literally exists in the past, and his goal is to use the powers that he was able to extract from Callie after experimenting on her to control time all over Hexaville, keeping it from marching forward into the future, blissfully slowed so he can be reunited with the daughter that he has, in brutal honesty, already lost. He needed the missing daughter to achieve this, as he had awakened the same powers inside her, but with her absent, he needed someone to take her place, and offers Cat that position. Understandably, Cat declines this offer. It really wasn't much of a request, as we see Brahman isn't above taking out people who disagree with him, and is willing to do the same to Kat, proclaiming her as a public threat and forcing her into hiding. She tries to return home, which was obviously a bad idea, but it leads to one of my favorite little lines. This is where Bit appears to Kat for the first time, not yet revealing that he's the third creator of this world. She's not sure if she can trust him at first, but he tells her that being suspicious isn't like her. It's gotten her into trouble a couple of times, but she's a person who trusts other people and their ability to do good, and and I love this little reminder not to lose that part of herself. She also finds help from one of those patrol robots that seems to have been hacked by someone. Kat's not sure who it is, but decides to take Bit's advice, accepting his help and sneaking past patrols and luring Callie out into the open where the police come forward with a video showing the true nature of Brahman and Callie's intentions, setting the record straight, and Raven and Cece show up. Sometimes these things just kind of happen in this game. If I think too hard about it, I'm gonna hurt something, so I'm just not gonna question it. Raven and Cat beat the crap out of Callie, and things seem fine at first, but Brahmin is still on the run and has control over the Grigos across the city, and they start attacking the police headquarters to get Cece. Turns out, she's the missing sister, Durga. Not only that, but Callie and Durga were two of the orphans that were kidnapped back in the day by Brahmin. In fact, they were the only two that survived his experiments. Cece awakens to her persona as Durga, joining Callie in attacking Cat and Raven in a fight that goes so poorly for our leading ladies that the creators have to step in and send them through another rift plane section. I'm not gonna lie, this particular area feels a little forced and slightly like padding. It's used to establish a returning super ability known as Panther Mode, which is really just a strong combat form. Think literally every rage mode you've ever used in an action game, but the way to trigger it seems wonky. Like, it relies on the SP meter, but also on something else, maybe low health, to activate? It's fine, it's whatever. Once we finally leave this area, we can enter the finale, stopping the devices surrounding the city from freezing it in time, leading to another battle against the Angel Sisters that, once again, proved to be a little bit much for our gravity shifters. See, this is kind of what I'm talking about, though. This just feels redundant. But help does come from an unexpected source, as Lisa comes charging in, bringing the entire city of Jirgapara Lao into the battle. And you know what? This got me. I actually thought this was pretty neat. Like, it's a floating city. What's to say it can't also be mobile? And Lisa's got the motivation. She's been tracking down her daughter, calling out to the girl she raised and breaking through the deranged Durga persona, enough to bring her back and leaving Callie as this sole threat. After a quick scuffle, Callie lets it all out, her power going out of control to turn into a dragon guard boss, good lord. I love this set piece though, it's a powerful visual and once again plays with the game's ability to provide an amazing sense of scale to its encounters. It also just makes me feel pity. I see Callie as a victim of Brahman's influence and despite the threat that she currently poses, it's hard not to sympathize with the fact that she shouldn't even have these powers, she shouldn't have been put in this place to begin with. And it makes you wonder, if Brahman had never existed, 
Well, what could have been? But as this part of the game has taught us, the past is gone. The reality of what needs to be done is in the here and now, and tragic though it may be, Callie Angel and her deformed state need to be destroyed. The day is saved, and time can move on. The credits roll as we see Brahmin's fate killed by the wreckage of his own ship. Lisa is reunited with her daughter, Cece mourns for her sister's fate, and the clock is left to tick ever onward. Sadly, Sid is still missing. He never reappeared before Lisa brought the city here. I guess not every story has all its threads tied up, but Lisa brings up a man named Alias, obviously the man who was controlling the Grigo from before, and obviously Sid and Alias are the same guy. Come on, we've known that since game one. But he seemed to leave an ominous message about the end of the world approaching, a dark warning to an outcome we may never see. While the game's story wraps up, I think it lays out some important messages about relying too much on looking to the past, while also warning us about becoming so obsessed with the future that we don't properly care for the time we exist in now. But if I'm being honest, it still feels like there's something missing. The game is not over. The credits were a bait and switch, ending on a shot of a mysterious glowing figure we soon see calling out to Cat. Who is this person? Why can only Cat see her? After everything we've done, what more is there? Cat chases the woman down, slowly starting to understand her pleas for freedom, for help. The only direction she's given is to ascend to the top of the world pillar. As the figure disappears, an alias shows up to us personally, this time to warn us about what's coming. In the first game, we learned that the dark ocean, the fearsome abyss, has been slowly rising, threatening to engulf all civilizations within its maw. Maybe the fact that it's been growing closer is what's been leading to the stronger Nevi, to the growth of the gravity storms. Whatever the case, it's here, and the only place Cat can look for salvation is up. She and Raven climb to the top of the world pillar together, and I think that this final rift plane style sequence is really good, getting some good use out of the gravity shifting styles, playing with puzzles centered around the flow of time, and all the while, the girls chat about this all feeling like something they've done before, and that the higher they rise, the more powerful and complete their abilities feel. Finally, they reach the top, a misty landscape dusted with silently falling snow, an entire city hiding above the world, and even an escort who's been expecting them. There's an unnerving sense of dread here. Even the Nevi are more docile, more like pearls than shadows, and large as the city seems, there's no sense of life. As they arrive at a castle among the towers, they're greeted by the king, a young boy accompanied by a deer who seems similar in nature to Dusty and Z, and suddenly... Queen Alua is woken up at her desk. She was dreaming again. It's time for the routine, attending the royal audience. Travel to the throne room, listen to her people talk, and return to bed, ready for the cycle to begin anew tomorrow. It seems like she was gone for quite some time, a hundred years in fact, and the castle's staff is worried about her sickly condition. She can provide her duty during the audience, but nothing more. It would be too dangerous for her to leave the castle. Given enough time, she should recover and her memory should return. It was really no cause for concern. Her nephew Kai has done a fine job taking care of the kingdom of Eto, while she was missing, and now he's just worried about her health. We can't see the people of the kingdom, but Alua is assured that they're doing quite well. There's some vague mention of a gravity storm rising from far below, but at the top of the world pillar, the passage of time is in their favor. Everything moves so slowly beneath them that the threat is too far away to even worry about. Return to her chambers, read a book, wake up, go towards the throne room. No, no, don't worry about that door. There's, there's nothing in there of importance. Attend the audience, return to her chambers. The window is sealed shut now. Interesting. Wake up, attend the audience, return to her chambers, wake up, audience. In her constant cycle, Alua is left breadcrumbs to some unknown mystery. A key, a torn page from a book, and now an heirloom. A music box playing a tune from another time, and for the first time since she returned home, the doors to her chamber are open, and she can finally see what was in that room she was barred from entering. What could possibly be hidden in here? This whole section is wild. Don't get me wrong, it's dull, it's strange, and it feels like it comes out of nowhere, but that's sort of what I love about it. We're hit with a crazy sense of whip 
whiplash, and while we're fitting right into this expected routine that's supposed to take place here, we just know it all feels wrong, even if we're finally being given some answers about just who Kat used to be and where she actually came from. She was royalty, she was the queen of an entire kingdom, but something here is terribly wrong, and as we're given these tiny little nuggets of something that might progress the story, we're desperate for a way to break this cycle, just as she is. I think it's a great example of depriving the player of what they want in order to envelop them in the roleplay, to really bring them that one step closer into the fiction that they're invested in. And of course, as we finally enter this door that's been sealed off from us, seeing Raven chained to the wall, imprisoned like a criminal, we're brought back to a place we remember, but also given a dark realization about this place we've been spending the past few days in. Raven, Dusty, and Z have been in here since the arrival at the castle, and now with her memories and her locked away guardian returned, she can resume her mission that she came here to complete. She hears some figures chatting in the hall, and a lot of stuff is revealed here. First of all, Alias. Yeah, so in the first game, I thought his name was pronounced Elias, which I thought sounded all right. I thought it was just a cool name, but then he drops this little thing where no, it's literally an alias for his actual name, and I felt kind of silly. Oh, and it is Sid. He's from Mato 2. Turns out, he and another man are trying to take the true control of the kingdom away from Kai and return it to Alua, or as we know her now, Kat. After an encounter with the Child King, the two would-be traitors are disposed of, or at least the one that isn't a remotely controlled robot, and Kai sets forth to break an imprisoned force free from her chains for reasons yet unknown. This is the figure we were approached by before, now known as Electricity. It's not spelled how you might expect, and it might sound a little silly at first, but I honestly think it's kinda cool to name a destructive force an ancient civilization sealed away in fear of what it might bring forth after an element of technological progress. Kat is visited by Bit once again and sent through a maze of her own mind to reclaim her memories. Okay, now this part is... Alright, but I do think while taking so much agency away from the player worked wonders before, here it feels a little more egregious as we're faced with puzzles to solve to essentially unlock a bunch of micro cutscenes. Maybe this was the best way to establish a bunch of this backstory? But it does feel like it brings the pacing to a halt as we know the real action is going down in the world below as Hexaville and Jirgapara Lao are trying to fight off this practical god that's been hurled down at them. But at least Raven is sent down that way while Bit stays up here and helps Cat through her little mental journey of self-discovery. What we learn is sort of simple. Queen Alua learned about the rising of the Dark Ocean and wanted to try to put forth efforts to rescue the world below, but those she tried to convince turned against her. Kai, because she did not have a guardian like the other royals did, making her, in his eyes, unworthy of rule, and Chancellor Xero, the man we saw before with Alias, because he believed she would doom the Kingdom of Eto by trying to help out the kingdoms in the path of the Dark Ocean's destruction. And here we are at full circle. No regard to what the future will bring, no effort to learn from the past as other cities below them had fallen to the Abyss, we have a civilization not obsessed with the past or the future, but with the present. The worst case scenario of living in the now above all else and a proud kingdom of advancement with no respect to what led it in its progress, with no sense of consequences to imprisoning a powerful, sentient being for centuries on end, complete, willful ignorance of anything other than present comfort and in turn, the most gullible and cowardly city of them all. There was an attempt on Alua's life, trying to send her down to the world she so desperately wanted to save, and when Sid tried to stop it, he was literally stabbed in the back and... Man, what a dark little detail here, where you can use the gyro sensor in the controller to shift the panels of this scene and see the drops of Sid's blood staining the background under it. This is also where we learn the new origin of another character. As the betrayed queen was cast down to the world below, her personality was split in two. One part found in Cat, and the other found in Raven. Their lives were saved by bits, and the rest is as we know it. Kat finally knows her history, but far down below, the world is on fire, as everyone who's able joins forces in a desperate struggle to fight off the invasion of electricity and the Eto Nevi. And here, we have a chance to play as Raven, and it is so cool. I mean, she mostly plays like Kat, but she has an insanely destructive SP move, and can throw so many objects at once, and man, what an insane set piece she's given. The music here is incredible. A haunting, but also a heroic score that captures this feeling of a desperate struggle against the apocalypse while even weaving the tune of Raven's theme in for good measure. Electricity is a tough force to nail down though, and even with Raven's powerful drill kick, it's just not enough to beat her. One by one, we see all our allies getting torn apart. Unica especially got a rough beating here, and sadly, Raven can only hold on for so long until she's knocked out unconscious. Cat is finally able to arrive on the scene, and it just keeps the momentum of this fight going as she charges in screaming. Devastated by 
by the sight of her defeated comrades, and wow, this game really wants to sell how ridiculously powerful this opponent is. We've already been in a two-phase fight against her as Raven, and even Cat is barely able to keep up with her. This fight is tough, and if you're not paying any attention, you can get wiped out almost instantly. And if you thought fighting just one of her was difficult, seeing her clone an entire army of herself is absolutely terrifying. This is so awesome. The sense of finality and hopelessness on display here is in full swing, and at its height, the game just keeps throwing you at her time and time again, letting you win just enough to think you're making progress in this battle, only to knock you back down and show you just how outmatched you really are. With the help of the creators, though, we slowly start evening the playing field, and even among Kai's jeers and taunts, we keep going, we keep trying, that's just who Cat is. With a final gift from Siania, we're able to weed out the true, original electricity, and finally, after a whole chain of grueling fights, we manage to take her down. Kai breaks down, screaming in protest that it shouldn't have been possible. He wanted to create a new world, not caring who was destroyed in the process of getting there, and that leads to Cat just... <laughs> Hell yeah, thank you! But still, even now, it's not over. How did Kai even know about electricity? Who whispered these ideas of conquest and tyranny into his mind? The one threat that we still haven't defeated, the one that's been chasing us since the first game and attempting to swallow the whole world. The Dark Sea has been here the whole time, influencing the dark intentions we've seen throughout the games, convincing Kai to destroy the world below so nothing would stop him from consuming all, and now, in a final attempt to destroy the only barriers in his way, the darkness takes form. I love how throughout these adventures, we've tackled enemies big and small, politicians, possessed cities, gods made of electricity, and right here, at the very end, the game just says, Alright, here's Satan. Cat has been beaten down, but she still gets up to fight this thing. It might have big, obvious weak points, but it's vicious and will not stop coming back for more. Even when the Jergaparalau fleet comes in to help, it's still not enough as he regains his health again and again, slowly chipping away at Cat's abilities and even weakening her more and more. We've worked hard over the past two games to develop an impressive arsenal of powers, and they're all being stolen from us one by one until we're weaker than we've ever been. Even Cece comes in and tries to use her light and powers to crystallize it, we perform a finisher and still, it gets back up. We're sent flying one more time. Dusty disappears along with our powers, and Cece is swatted away like a bug. The city is in ruins. We have all fallen and we lay here on the ground as the darkness pleads for us to stop doing this to ourselves. The Dark Ocean, the overarching villain of these games, congratulates us for fighting so bravely, ensuring us that he can make us feel like none of this ever happened, that we can finally stop fighting and let him take control. We won't even know anything is wrong, we won't even remember this deal, so why fight? In the rubble of a city in tatters, there's one thing still standing. Not its heroes, but its people. A chant rings out as they band together, an outcry of support that finally reaches Kat's ears and calls her to get up one last time. I find this scene truly moving, as corny as that can come across. There's a strength to this sense of community, that the people she's given everything to protect, more than they'll ever even know, have all come to display their belief in her. She's able to take this strength to take down the monster, but has one final mission that Bit had given her earlier, to travel to the center of the abyss from which the darkness spawned and become the seal that would close it shut forever. One last step on a journey that has finally come to an end. We're given one last part of the game to play, a day in the life of Raven. We float around the city, catching up with the characters we've met and seeing how they've recovered. A sort of interactive, where are they now segment, and a victory lap where we get to see a glimpse of a brighter future that we've helped establish for the people. While just about everyone has been able to move on to better things, the most interesting developments we get to see are from Raven herself, showing how she's begun to open up to people, to connect with others the way Kat once did. She's grown as a person, her edges have softened, and she's become more of a a part of the growing community as both cities have worked together to rebuild, but the 
pain is still there. During our time in Eto, we finally discovered that Cat and Raven are two pieces of a puzzle that was once Queen Alua. Individuals in their own right, but one person is not complete without the other. All the same, she's found ways to move on, to let herself grow and change, even if she has a hard time letting go of who she lost. This section captures the lessons we've learned. Remember yesterday, and learn from it. Be mindful of tomorrow, but use today to nurture what it will become. It was important to show how the flow of time can bring not only hardship and confusion and uncertainty, but here it's recontextualized. What once felt like an inevitable threat is now a comforting promise. You will not stay in this moment forever, and time will march ever onward. Tomorrow is still coming, and who knows? Maybe it'll bring something that we lost yesterday. You should have played Gravity Rush 2, and I don't really mean that as a callout. Except for maybe a few of you. Please branch out every once in a while, Assassin's Creed and Call of Duty ain't going anywhere. What, what I really mean is you should have gotten to play Gravity Rush 2. Time is unkind. Sometimes I think the game industry moved too quickly. The constant push for bigger, grander graphical engines and this push to attain a similar experience to film, overtaking the focus on what makes this medium special, unique, or effective. Spectacle and eye candy take priority. The products that are pushed the most are jacks of all trades, made for everyone but excelling in little or constantly trying to justify their own existence to people who don't take video games seriously as a form of expression, as a vehicle of experience, imagination, and soul. These are not problems problems unique to the game industry, but this market still feels so young and the bubble is bloated in such a short amount of time. Great masterworks are still created and still appreciated to this day, even titles in the big AAA market that maybe do prioritize the film-centric ideals a little too much still have a lot of great stuff to offer and they're still put together by people who truly care, they're worth acknowledging. Those that claim games aren't as good as they used to be often don't explore outside of the same yearly release or the first item that they see on a shelf, constantly overlooking anything that would be weird or childish to them. The hang-ups and misplaced sense of being above these forms of entertainment are an absolute toxin that only serve to limit the works that are deemed worth making. Japan's studio closing and the departure of the team that worked on these games, Project Siren, felt like just one big loss in a trend that only seems to be happening more rapidly these days. The sacrifice of the strange, the weird, the original for concepts that can be sanitized and easily gobbled up by the masses for an insatiable industry. I'll say it again, you should have played Gravity Rush 2, and I blame Sony for refusing to push this series, for refusing to give this studio the help it so desperately needed, for sacrificing the value of artists over the value of the dollar that they already have plenty of, but hey, that's business, right? It seems like everywhere we look now, we're losing more and more titans in the industries that entertain us because people funding their projects don't even understand or respect the products that made them rich. This can't keep us from daring to explore and create. We are the storytellers, we are the shapers of experience, and every day we're seeing smaller studios banding together to create what the overlords of the AAA market think are obsolete and proving them wrong every step of the way. This is why I make videos to share what I love, to tell you what you just might love too, to help you understand what I see in things that have gone overlooked, or to share in your love or explore my own passion for an industry that someday I still hope to work in. I think it's appropriate to talk about this game now while its future is still uncertain. Maybe we will get that remaster, maybe it'll run at a nice 60 FPS, maybe it'll give us access to all those lost costumes, maybe in a perfect world we'll even have the first game accessible to PC too, giving people a chance to really experience this franchise at its most complete. These possibilities and these maybes will likely be outdated in just a couple of months, and if you're watching this after that happens, dang, what a weird concept time is, right? One way or another, I hope you give this game a shot. I hope I've helped convey why it means so much to me. I think it's fun, I think it's expressive, I think it's hilarious, I think it's touching. I think that it helps capitalize on everything that made the first game good to make something truly great, to really sing out the passion and the creativity of an amazing team that worked on this and so many other games. This is the breath of life of everything I love in this industry all in one package. And hey, maybe it'll help you think about time a little bit differently. Don't let it go unchecked. If you don't use time to experience this game, maybe you can use it to play one you've always been curious about, to review a game that you love, maybe even make one. Make a future that you'll be proud of. We could all learn 
from Gravity Rush 2. And now, I need to stop running away from time too. Making this review was important to me, and I think I needed to sit down and learn these lessons, to stop being afraid of the passage of time, to stop worrying so much about the mistakes from yesterday, to stop treating today like a prison, and to stop stressing out so much about tomorrow, to rest and to find my passion again for what I do. Time moves forward, and I'm ready to start moving again too. Thank you so much for your patience in the meantime. I have plenty to get back to work on for later this year, but until then, go find something fun to play. Remember that my top tier patrons get to see these videos two days early. You can find me on Twitter, Twitch, Discord, whichever you prefer. Links in the description. And of course, as always, spread the word, tell your friends, and until we see each other again, thank you so much for watching. See you next mission. And there it is, my big comeback, finally. I uh, never want a gap between my videos to be that large again, uh, but I am back, and I intend to stay for a while. Although I am probably going to have to slow myself down a little bit, maybe take on some, uh, some smaller content, and maybe focus less on uh, the hour plus long major videos, at least for a little bit to, to ease back in, make up for some of the lost time, get some content back on the channel. But Digimon World 3 is inevitably going to be another big one. With all of that said, uh, and I've said a lot in this video already, I do owe some huge thanks to the people that have been supporting me the entire way uh, up to this point, and I owe a very special amount of shout out to my current top tier patrons over on Patreon. This month they are Brendan Hess, Earl Valco, Hyper Mecha SP, Jazzy Jefferson, Jeremiah Harrison. Kernium, Lederick, Mackenzel, Mitch Pym, Patricia Marcou, Serif13, Cinderin7, Snapkick, and Cirrus the Skeptic. Thank you guys so, so much just for the amount of support that you've given me and the amount of dedication that you all have had uh, with the complete lack of uploads for almost half a year at this point, and you still stuck with it this entire time just waiting for me to get back on top of things and I'm, I'm hoping to pay that forward for all of you you guys make this possible and you make it worth it with all of that said it's time to get back to work and i'll see you next mission